Right, if you haven't got a Bible, just, oh, here we go. Um, try and uh, grab, that's coming out of me. Am I coming out of here? Yeah, we're okay. We're okay. We're all good. Um, we are, um, if you haven't got a chap, if you haven't got a Bible in front of you, it's worth trying to grab one. Uh, so you can see that what I'm saying is, is coming out of the text on page 1164, um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And let me pray as we come and, and look at God's word together. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Father, we thank you that um, as we consider the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ to us, um, his sacrifice, uh, his willingness to become poor so that we might become spiritually rich. Thank you that we find out about this gift through your words. And we pray this morning our hearts might be reignited, might be challenged. May your spirit be at work as we hear what your word has to say. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Now, um, uh, when you're reading the Bible, one of the ways you can kind of work out what the big idea is, is by seeing the repeated idea. And what I would like is just a little bit of help from you um, as uh, we look at uh, 2 Corinthians. And uh, some verses are going to come on the screen. And I want you to read out the word in yellow. Okay? We're going to do it. So this is verse 5. Finish arrangements for a gift, then it will be ready for a well done, gift, well you did the gift for me thank you, verse 6 whoever sows will reap right, verse 11 you'll be enriched so you can be and through us your will result in thanksgiving to God, verse 13 for your in sharing with them. So um, I get you get the idea. Um, at the heart of this passage is a call to generosity, to being generous, uh, to giving generously. Um, if it's your first time here at Surrey Chapel, we, um, you've, there we go, we're being called to be generous. Um, we're working through this book of um, two Corinthians, and um, Paul in chapter 8 and 9 is telling this church in Corinth, which is sort of they never eat shredded. It's down the south bit of, um, of Greece. And um, he's encouraging them to um, give money to a church in Jerusalem that is currently struggling because of persecution and struggling financially. And he's telling them to be ready. He's sending three strapping lads, including a bloke called Titus, to turn up at the church. And Paul is then going to come. They're going to collect this offering, which they're going to go and take to this church in Jerusalem. And he's prepping them saying, make sure you are ready. Make sure you are ready to give um, this gift. And what sort of gift does he want to, want to get? One that is generous. Now, um, this is um, on my Apple dictionary. What does generous mean? Um, being generous means showing a readiness to give more of something, especially money, than is strictly necessary or expected. So, you know, don't you love it when you have a generous portion of pudding? We, we know what generosity looks like. Oh, wow, there's more there than I could ever meet. It's not just trying to meet the need. It's going above and beyond that need. That is generous. Whereas on the other side, there is miserly. And I'm not going to make any gags at the expense of any nationality with regards to being called a miser. Um, but a miser, someone who is penny pinching. I know, I know it's, some people call it cheese pairing. Have you heard that before? People from the north have. There we go. Sorry. So there we go. Cheese pairing. I've never heard that. Uh, penny pinching, cheese pairing means it's, it's someone who hoards wealth, does their, the most, most they can do to kind of not spend as much as possible. Uh, Paul is saying to this church, don't be miserly. Don't just go for adequate. Go for generous. Go for generosity in your giving. Now, um, generosity is something that actually the sciences say is really good for you. I was looking at some articles um, over this past week, and in the Huffington Post, um, there was this headline that said, generosity is good for you. 
And you know, there's lots and lots of research in at the moment at the, the sort of the health benefits, as it were, of being a generous person. Generous with your time, generous with your energy, generous with your skills, generous with your money. So apparently, uh, there is a link between being generous in your marriage, generous with your time, generous with your energy, and having a happy marriage. That probably isn't that surprising, is it? But apparently, people who volunteer their time in organizations for the sake of helping serve others, actually, rather than leaving them depleted and lacking energy, actually volunteering makes them happier. That's what the, that's what the research says. Um, in the workplace, uh, when you are trying to help someone, not trying to help someone in the workplace because uh, if I help them, then they will owe me. They will owe me. No, no, no. I'm trying to help someone else in the workplace genuinely for their good, trying to help them with their work, trying to help things push on. Apparently, people who are likely to do that enjoy their work more. Uh, there's a scientific link as well. Being generous with your possessions apparently means you end up living longer. Who would have thought it? Actually, no, if I can keep as much to myself as possible, then I live, you know, as long as I can keep my life as hassle-free, then I live a really long, happy life. Actually, scientifically, apparently you live longer. Now, um, Paul, when he is encouraging this church in Corinth to be generous, he doesn't say, be generous because it's good for you. But it probably shouldn't surprise us. There's the scientists sort of dig into this idea of generosity. They find it's actually good for people. Why is that? Because actually that is the nature of the way God has made us to be. And as we increasingly line up with the way God has made us to be, we should find there is a flourishing in life. Now look, um, what are we doing today? Right, we're going to look through this passage, and I think there are four big things that Paul teaches us about why we need to be generous. And not just generous with our money, generous with our time, generous with our energy, generous with our skills. Four big reasons. And the first big reason is a kind of a, it's a wider theological point, really. And it's this. If you're someone who is a Christian, God has saved you for generosity, now, I'm just aware there are people here who are not Christians. And um, I hope as you listen into this, uh, we don't want your money. Let me just be clear. We're not here. We're not about to get the, the, the plates out and say we want your money. We don't want your money. We are here so that people can come to know Jesus. And we're thrilled for you to be around. But um, maybe as you listen in, you might think, you know, that's a really intriguing way of thinking about money. Because let's face it, everyone's thinking about money. Everyone's thinking about money. Cost of living crisis. What's going on with the government? What's going on with my bills? Have I got enough? Am I going to survive? Well, we're going to have to cut back on everyone is thinking about money. And into that context, where actually in Corinth, they would have been thinking about money. Things had not been that straightforward for them either. He says to them, God has saved you for generosity. God has saved you for generosity. In fact, if you know Jesus... It really does not fit with being stingy and tight. Okay, he saved you for generosity. Just have a look at chapter 8, verse 9. Here is the driving force. It's a natural outflowing for the Christian of what God has done for them. Have a look at 8, verse 9. Uh, look at what he says. Um, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ... That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. See, at the heart of the Christian's generosity is not a case that the Christian's going, I'm trying to buy my way into God's good books. I'm trying to buy my way into heaven. No, no, no. Uh, the reason a Christian is 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 hopeful of heaven and, and knows God now, it's not because they've given enough money, it's because Jesus has given himself for them. It's a free gift. He's left the glory of heaven and he was rich there. He became so poor to the, poor, the point of the cross 
so that as we trust him with our poverty, we become spiritually rich. We become to know God perfectly. We come into relationship with him eternally. And Paul says, look, as you reflect on this truth, what is a natural outworking of that? As God saves you to be like his son, a natural outworking of that is that you are generous. Now that does go against our nature. That really does go against our nature. I mean, one of the things um, I have not had to talk, teach my girls um, as they've grown up. I've got three girls, and they're not little anymore. But when they were little, there was one word they absolutely nailed very early doors. And that was this word, mine. Yeah. Mine! No, 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 look, look, let your little sister play. Mine! Um, Augustine of Hippo, um, he's a theologian from way back in the day. But he put it like this. He reflected on the nature of sin and what it is. He, he described it like this. This is some Latin. and I'm gonna, uh, I can barely pronounce myself in English, let alone Latin. So look at this. He says this. He describes it as incurvitus in se. Incurvitus in se. And that means that we are curved in on ourselves. He says when you think about the nature of sin... The thing about the nature of our rebellion against God, what does it look like? It looks like, uh, it looks like mine. It looks like my life is absolutely curved in on me. I'm trying to grasp as much and make life work so that the world revolves around me. He says, that is sin. Now, if you are someone who is a Christian, uh, God has sought to save you in Jesus from sin, one of which those aspects is this selfish desire to grab and be in the center. And so what is the obvious natural outworking? Christ didn't grab. He didn't say it's all about me and my glory, so I'm going to stay in heaven. He gave. He was generous. See, as we look at our money, as you look at your talents and your gifts, do you first and foremost think, this is about me and my happiness with me at the center. I need my money because I need to grasp it to wield power and get my own way. And Jesus says, no, I've saved you from that. I've saved you for generosity. Unsurprisingly, all those science journals say, actually, that is generosity is good for you. And that is because that is the way God has made us to be. Costly, sacrificial generosity. Now, look, um, it's just worth saying, he's not, he's not saying to this church, look, I want you to be a doormat or naive with regards to your generosity. You know, I remember being, uh, when I was roughly a student in fact just a couple of years after being a student I remember being at a train station in Reading and I was sat there reading a book about how you share your faith and someone came up to me and said I need some money to go and visit my aunt Anne and I've got six pounds and I need 11 pounds and I said I don't have any money and they said oh you can get some from the cash machine I thought I want to help this person so I walked with him down to the cash machine I put my card in and he knocked me over there. He didn't. He didn't. But, um, but I, I keyed my money. And he, it was like this voice in my ear saying, oh, maybe you should get out a bit more. And anyway, I ended up giving him like more money than I should have done. And rather than being like intelligent, going, right, I'm going to take you to buy a ticket at the train station. I gave him the money. He gave me what he, what he described would be six pounds. It was like two pounds or something like that. And this person ran out of the train station. Now, um, that person probably wasn't trying to see their Auntie Anne. Okay, I th- I've got a feeling they wanted to go and buy some drugs or something like that. They were in a bit of a mess. Um, Paul is saying, you know, the nature of the Christian life, it doesn't mean being naive, right? It's not being a doormat, but our inclination should always be towards generosity. Now, if you're not a Christian... And you meet someone who's a Christian and you think, wow, this person who follows Jesus is tight. They are really tight with their money and they're miserly. 
feel free to say to them, you're a bit of a contradiction in terms. Because I went to church and they said the generous God was generous to you. And therefore, one of the things he's saving you is for his generosity. Why, aren't you, why haven't you bought me a pint yet? Do you want you, like, honestly, challenge them. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't fit. God saves us for generosity. There is the wider theological point. But then actually, as we dig into this text, um, the th- Paul motivates them in three really surprising ways. The first one is most surprising, because I would never have preached this. But have a look at verse 6. Here's the second thing to see. He says, so generously to reap generously. So generously to reap generously. Just have a look at verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And in this um, verse here, Paul is taking the church to Corinth out of the city into the farmer's fields. And um, he's saying to uh, Farmer Giles, he's saying, well, he's not saying to Farmer Giles, he said, look at Farmer Giles, okay? He has got a field. There is his field, Farmer Giles' field. Now, if he wants to reap a really big harvest, where does he need to sow? Where does he need to sow his seeds? Now, um, for Farmer Giles to receive a really big harvest, he is, if he just sows in one little small corner of the field, how much of that field will produce a great harvest? Just that little corner. The whole rest of the field will be empty. But if he wants to see a massive harvest, what does he need to do with his seed? He needs to put it everywhere. He needs that seed to go in every nook and cranny because any farmer knows you do not get a harvest from a place where you have not sowed seeds. You see, to reap generously... You have to sow generously. But if you don't want a big harvest, then just be really stingy. And you'll get back what you get back. Now, let me me be clear. Now, there'll be some churches, and actually some churches in Norwich, who off the back of this will therefore say, they will say, "Um, so actually, if you give your money generously, God will therefore make you really rich financially rich the more you give the more you get back financially now let's let's be clear that is not what this passage is saying and let me show you why right that is not what god teaches have a look that is not there is a harvest but it's not a harvest that you give in your couple of grand and then you get back a lamborghini Right, That is not how it works. Have a look at verse 10. Now, he who supplies the seed, you know, his acknowledgement that God is the one who supplies it all, to the sower and bread for food, will also supply, increase your store of seed, and will enlarge what? The harvest of your righteousness. Have a look at verse 9. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever see paul says here as you give you do get back as you give money which is temporary you get back something that is permanent and what is that permanent thing you get back a harvest of righteousness you know there is something in the act of giving that makes us more and more like Jesus, kind, generous, outward looking. There is a harvest of righteousness there, but also this verse in verse 10 is, is combining a couple of ideas. We're not going to flip back to them. Isaiah 55, 10 for your notes if you want to look at it at home, and Hosea 10, verse 12. And both of, both of these uh, verses, particularly Isaiah 55, 10, it's the verse that talks about God saying, my word goes out from my mouth and it will not return to me empty. See, this harvest of righteousness is about God's word as it goes out, his promise that it will bring his people back 
And it will be an instrument of grace for the salvation of others. As Paul calls this church and actually calls us to use our financial resources, he is saying use it to release the word of God into the world. Use it to help maybe a poor church, to help gospel workers to be able to live so they can preach, to help the gospel go out. As you use your money in this way, let's be clear, there will be a harvest of righteousness. Now, I wonder, what was the last thing you bought that you thought, this is going to change my life? Should I tell you what we bought as a family that we thought was going to change our life? It was this. Okay, and for those of you who don't know what that is, um, that is a, uh, uh, an automatic electronic vacuum cleaner that you charge up and then you set it off and it goes around bumping around the room and it is kind of, it, it, it sort of vacuums. It does the job for you. And my wife was like, Reese, they're on offer in Lidl. You've got to go and get one. I was like, do we really need this? Oh, it's going to change everything. It's going to change everything. And so we went and got it and we brought it back. And do you know what? In terms of an investment of our money, it was a complete waste of it. What a disaster. Within three times, the battery had run out and, you know, Grace had given up putting the chairs up on the things and it was bumping and not actually going doing any cleaning. It was rubbish. Maybe you've got one and it was brilliant. Who's got one and it's brilliant? Who's got one and it's changed their life? It's a scam. Don't touch it. Although there are some of us who are afraid to acknowledge that we've got the electronic vacuum cleaner. But... Um, but here, here is Paul, okay, and he's saying to this church, he's saying to them, um, as you invest in the gospel, you are not investing in something that you will throw in the bin tomorrow. You're investing in a righteousness that endures forever. It will last forever. You're given away something temporary to gain something that is eternally permanent. As you give to God and his work, what you get back is far greater than you will ever give. Because people last for eternity. Stuff doesn't. Your iPhone won't. Your car won't. Your house won't. People do. So generously to reap generously. Thirdly, generous giving puts a smile on God's face. Generous giving. Just have a look at verse 7. Just look at this. And actually you could be saying, Reesey, no, you're misreading this first. Look at this. Each of you shall give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful Giver. And do you notice here, verse 7, actually, that the smile seems to be on the face of the giver. Um, and I've just said, generous giving puts a smile on God's face. Now, look, verse 7, he's being practical here. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. And if you were here last week, you will know that it's according to what you have, not what you don't have. It's not about putting yourself into debt. Um, and the bills are going up and you just think, okay, how is life going to work? And we need to cover our bills and we need to make sure we're in a, you know, we can put a warm roof over and put food on the table. But he said, once you've worked that stuff out, think, what can you give? And he says, what is the nature of your giving? It needs to be cheerful. Uh, literally, it means hilarious or abandoned. Um, how do you feel when you get the opportunity to give? Financially, with your time or energy, do you go, great, I get to give? Is it through a grimace or is it with a grin? Um, the reason why I think you can give with a grin, verse 7, is because you are acknowledging that actually God is the one who's given you everything you have. Just have a look at verse 8. As I give, let me look, look at this, and God is able to bless you abundantly. All things are his anyway, so that in all things and all times, having all that you need, he's not promising all that you want, 
But having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As I give sacrificially and cheerfully, actually there is a part of that is me going, do you know what? Uh, I don't know what will come tomorrow, but I can trust that God will provide for me. Now, it's not saying you shouldn't have a rainy day fund. But actually, if as a Christian, all my security is in my savings, then I'm in trouble. Because there is a rainy day that will come that your savings will not be able to cover the cost of. Only Christ can hold us when the darkest days come. See, the reason I can give tomorrow is because I know God is in charge. I know I am his. And I know he'll provide for what I need. So that leads me to being generous today. Uh, One of my children, I've got three girls, and one of my children um, is, uh, bless her. This is not, she wasn't thinking about the gospel, but it was just really lovely. She had money for a birthday, a bit of money for a birthday. And we said, what do you want to do with that? And um, she wasn't like, oh, I'm going to save it up so I can get an electric scooter or something like that. She was like, I want to take my sisters to the cinema. That's cute, isn't it? And do you know, as I heard her say that, do you know what I did? I smiled. I was like, that is, that is cute. I, I want to give you even more money. If that's how you're going to use it. Imagine that times a million as our heavenly Father who owns everything looks down and sees us give out of the little we may have or maybe that he loves it, the generosity, because it just it's shown we trust him. He loves it. Generosity brings a smile to his face. Finally, also generosity brings glory to God. And I'm not going to say much about this. 11 to 15, it's all about that. But just have a look at verse 11. Um, Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, in many expressions of thanks to God. Verse 13, others will praise God for your obedience. Verse 15, thanks be to God. You see, the giving here is not about people getting their own plaque on the wall or people thinking they are the best it is about God receiving the praise him getting the glory so look four big things that fed into this church God has saved you for generosity so generously to reap generously generous giving puts a smile on God's face and generous giving brings glory to God and as I said Paul is writing into a specific situation he's not turning up at church in a couple of weeks time with a plate to say right where's your money for Jerusalem but actually what we are reading in here are principles that for today help us to think how we think about our money and how we think our giving And it may look like helping a church, struggling church. It may look like investing in gospel workers or being generous with our neighbor or gospel people or gospel initiatives. But two things briefly for us to think about as a church. Two things. And the first thing is this. The gospel truth has to play out in gospel culture. Um, The elders of the church, we meet um, uh, a couple of times a month. One of our meetings, we meet to pray and we eat together. And we've been reading a book by a guy called Ray Ortland called The Gospel, How the Church Portrays the Beauty of Christ. And one of his big things is um, you need not just to have gospel clear doctrine, but it has to play out in the way you are with each other. Gospel doctrine and gospel culture have to come together. And what does gospel doctrine look like for our culture? I think from 2 Corinthians 9, it is being generous. Do you think we are a generous church? Generous in our wallets, generous with our praise, generous with our time, generous with our forgiveness, generous without an agenda, Generous? What do you think? See, one of the ways we try and be generous um, as a church is having ministry trainees. And Aaron is a, um, a ministry trainee. And um, uh, the team here who are, we are training, we are trying to be generous because we want this to be a place where people can be trained and go out and lead churches elsewhere. That is generosity. That is part of the generosity thing. Um, 
It's a little aside, but um, Cameron Arden, if you, if, you're, you, if you receive our e-bulletin, um, which is called Church Matters, you'll have seen Cameron Arden, who's um, a little lad in this church. He's doing a fun run, a 2K fun run, to raise money for a girl in his class who's having to go to America for cancer treatment. And she's having to raise an awful lot of money. He's doing a fun run a couple of weeks. That'd be a great thing to support. That'd be a great way to give some money to sort of help him as he witnesses to this girl in his class who's going for life-saving treatment. Okay, there's a, there's just think, gospel culture, generous. But let me finish with this, a gospel patron. Um, this past week, um, there was a service in a church in London called All Souls Langham Place. And there was this bloke um, called John. It was 100 years since he formed a trust. John died in 1979. And just in case I forget it, um, that website, you need to write down because there's a 20-minute online film and you've got to watch it. It's only 20 minutes. It is fascinating. But let me quickly tell you about John. John was from a building family, 14 years old. He left school. He'd become a Christian at a young age and he joined the family business. And in this family business, it grew and grew and grew. But before he grew, he made this decision. He said, you know what? Um, as a family, we're going to live in this sort of size house and we're going to have these sort of holidays and we're going to drive this sort of car and we're going to save this sort of amount of money and anything above that we will give away. Now, this company um, is called Lang Builders and um, as this business grew, he ended up building the Seven Bridge, the old Seven Bridge that went over. He ended up building lots of the M1. Um, he ended up building, not him personally, his company. Um, he ended up building Coventry Cathedral. You cannot go around this country and not find stuff Lang Builders has built. And out of this money that was made, his, his standard of living did not go up. But his standard of giving went absolutely mad. And um, that's why they had this service to, to not celebrate him, but celebrate what God has done through him. And basically, the Christian union movement, if you are blessed by the Christian union movement, the reason you are blessed is because of John Lang. His money has supported and set that up from the word go. IFES that seeks to work, reach out in other countries, he's backed that up. Christianity Explored, that is now done in 167 different countries, has been done by a load of prisoners, about 20, 30, 40,000 prisoners in the UK. The money that helped that to happen came from the Lang Trust. Here is a man who sowed big, was incredibly generous, but do you know what he's got back from that? A harvest of righteousness that will last forever. Not electric hoover that you throw in the bin. Souls that will last for eternity, and he's been part of that. Some of you students could be the next Lang. I'm not saying there's other people in this room who may not be the next Lang. Maybe. But you don't need to be the next Lang. With, it could be your money, your time, your energy, your gifts. How can you be generous for the glory of God? and for the good of other people. Let's bow our heads and pray.